Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another virtual event at the Poison Pen. We're somewhere over 500 and enjoying every single one of them. It's so much fun. I apologize for being late to this one. It's all my fault, but here we are. So we are reunited again with Tess Gerritsen, one of our favorite authors, who I'm happy to say has been able to get to the pen for most of her books, uh, but not this time. Uh, she's the author of the fabulous Rizzoli and Isle series and assorted other books as the spirit moves her, sometimes in really interesting directions. And here she's paired up with a friend. Um, and is it pronounced Braver or Braver, Gary? Braver. Okay, Gary yeah. Braver, which is actually a pseudonym for an academic who, in the tradition, I think, of English academics and judges who always wrote their crime novels under pseudonyms, um, is joining in and, and they have together created um, what I have found is a new genre, you two. It's called dark academia. And I just read about it today, which I love. Uh, there's been this whole thing about Gothic novels and all of the, the permutations of them. My current favorite is commuter Gothic which means it happens on a train or a bus. <laughs> but, but dark academia is, um, you know, it's easy to think of Don and Tart, but there are other authors um, who, Carol Goodman, for example, wrote a great book called In the Lake of Dead Languages, her first novel, which was in this tradition. And uh, we're gonna talk about that. Let me say before I go any further that Tess has kindly signed copies of this wonderful book called Choose Me. And we still have a few left. And if we run out, we can get more. And Patrick will put a buy link into the comments field where he is lurking in the void um, and is happy to take your Facebook questions and he'll rejoin us and uh, present those questions as we go. So you two, um, what made you decide that you wanted to write a book set on campus? Gary, maybe I should ask you that since you're the one who's actually on campus. Actually, um, we met at a, a cocktail party, a Christmas party a few years ago, and um, it was at the height of the Me Too movement, and a lot of people are getting disgraced. And Tess said, you know, maybe we should write a book that examines uh, both sides of an illicit affair. You know, he, he said, she said kind of thing. And uh, that was, I thought it was a great idea. And so um, we, I sent her a chapter a few days, a few weeks later. And she was probably aghast that well, you're really jumping in <laughs> feet first. And, and she responded with a chapter and we went back and forth. And, you know, the two sides of an illicit affair. And that's what we decided to do, that uh, Tess would write the point of view chapters, the male point of view chapters, and I would write the male point of view chapters. Hers being the, the, the student, Karen Moore, uh, as well as uh, Frankie Loomis, the homicide detective. And I did the, uh, the, the college professor who has an affair with it with Karen. And that's how it began at a Christmas party a few years back, some years back, yeah. You know, it's really astonishing in the annals of crime fiction, how many ideas, good and bad, begin at a bar. <laughs> I mean, drinking has played a major role in the production <laughs> of crime fiction. And, and any veteran of a mystery conference will know that all the action at the conference actually takes place at the bar. Right, right Tess? Yeah. It's my favorite place. And by the way, uh, Belvedere Martini, if you ever meet me at a bar, that's what I want. So, <laughs> um, a side of contract. <laughs> it, it, it's very true. I mean, I think there's something about lubrication and alcohol where all of a sudden uh, the synapses start to move in weird new ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and it, it, it's exactly how Gary described it. We were just talking about the Me Too movement. And um, I've always been interested in how men and women can see the same situation in completely different ways. Mm -hmm. So my idea was, okay, so we have this illicit affair and um, it is, it's, and on the surface, it looks like a typical Me Too thing where the professor has an affair with his student and the professor is married. Um, bad, bad, bad professor, but maybe there's another side to the story. And that's, that's how it all got started. I think the fun part was that we did not really know where it was going. Um, all we knew, we started off knowing that the student would end up dead. Um, and who killed her? Was it the professor? We didn't know. So we just sort of plunged into this whole idea. Um, and the fun part was that I think that we or our characters tormented each other. Gary would write a chapter and I would write a chapter in response. And if we just kind of kept upping the ante as the book went right, on. Right, right. <laughs> it so was fun. Yeah. 
Karen is the is the um, the student in question. So, yeah. how did you all how did you collaborate to invent her backstory? Because you're right. I mean, if she dies, there must be a considerable backstory involved. So, did you did you collaborate on that, or did you do that alternately, or how did you how did you write about Taryn? Well, you know, Gary gave me a couple of ideas based on the fact that he is a college student and he deals with uh, female students all the time. So he had a good feeling about what, what kind of situations and what kind of things are, are troubling young women today. Uh, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to make, there, neither one of these was going to be totally a victim and neither one of these is going to be totally a villain. We wanted them to both have, you know, good and bad sides. So I wanted Taryn to start off being, I guess we would be sympathetic towards her because she is a bit of a victim. She's, she's, she's um, in terrible pain from having been rejected by her boyfriend. She is vulnerable, she is needy. Um, but where does that neediness turn and, and when does it become dark? And when does it become obsessive? So I think that was, that was really what I was going for is I was trying to find out how you know, when do you cross the line from being somebody who, who is, is an object of sympathy to someone who becomes someone we're afraid of? Um, so that I, you know, she developed as on the page as, as we worked on the story. I think both these characters developed um, as we were writing the book. So Gary, have you run into students like this? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> I yeah. have run into students with, with, uh, with problems. Um, I have not run into a student who is making a pass at me or is just trying to start an affair with another professor, but I, I certainly have met students who are troubled, uh, who are needy, um, who have had broken relationships with guys and uh, feeling very vulnerable and sometimes even suicidal. Uh, I had one student maybe three years ago who said she had the worst week of her life and she's really thinking of ending it. And so you know, I, I, I called someone who would, deals with stuff like that because I didn't feel qualified. Um, and she finally came out okay, but I, I have, seen, you know, in, in small courses like seminars, such as this course in, in, in the book, you only get a, you get a cap of 15 students. You get to know them over a three and a half, four months very well. And they come to you for not just academic guidance, but personal guidance, you know, family issues. So you, they sometimes spill over and let you know what's going on. And so that informed me uh, in some ways what Karen might have. Um, kids come to me and say, you know, they have a broken family, father left the mother and, and her as a baby years ago. So that uh, I, I gave to, to, to Tess and she laced that into the development of, of Taryn, which she did very, very well. You know, it's an interesting thought and obviously wouldn't fit with your Me Too design, but it would be interesting to write about a male student and a female professor mm -hmm. in a similar situation, because really, I didn't think that we can always assume that it's going to be um, a female who's the victim and a male professor who's either a predator or just really unwise or, or unlucky or a combination thereof. I mean, I think um, it's not so often written that the opposite dynamic, but I think that it's a valid one, especially today when women are, are trying to own, you know, what is the, the current phrase? Women are trying to have agency, you know, demanding agency. One of my least favorite words. That would be an interesting turnabout. Um, and in fact, I think that if I were to write that story, I once again, weirdly enough, I would have a woman end up dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, and why is that? I think there's there's something interesting. Well, maybe because I'm a, I'm a woman myself and women readers, we, we identify with the victims more than anything, I believe. So if, uh, if it's a, ma a male student and a female professor, um, somehow I would, I would be more engaged in it as a reader if it was the woman who died. It's some weird psychological thing going on here, but uh, there, there's a reason why so many crime novels involve dead women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, it's possibly because in real life, more violence is perpetrated on women um, exactly. than vice versa. Or when it's perpetrated on guys, it tends to be guys, you know, attacking guys in some sort of situation. Um, rather than women attacking guys, but I just I just think it's interesting, you know, if we're if we're going to give agency to women, then we should make them ruthless killers, oh, <laughs> or actually, as animal killers, actually, as the case may be. And Karen has agency in this book. She is pretty aggressive. I mean, yeah. she you know um, she is as much victimizing as as a victim too. I mean, of, of circumstances, and and we we wanted to give nuances to each. So neither are 
Karen and Jack exonerated nor fully vilified. There's this gray, portraits in gray is what we want rather than black and white. Um, it would be interesting, however, to have a, a novel where a female professor, not being predatory, but takes up with a male student. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it would still have to make the, make each character somewhat sympathetic so that it works without forcing this into the old mold by just reversing the genders. We had a real life case here in Scottsdale of a, of a woman who was quite a lot older than the teenage boy and a, a woman student who in fact was the predator, um, got a lot of press here, but it was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was high school um yes. in the college um situation it was high, it was high school yeah. yeah yeah i'm sorry tess i cut you off what was it you were going to say oh i i was i was uh, sort of um bouncing off what gary had said about the fact that taryn our our so-called victim does have a lot of agency and that's that's what i really liked about writing her is that mm -hmm. she's fierce she is she is somebody who is really, you know, alive um, and passionate. And even though her passion takes her down a dark hole, um, she's not going to sit back passively and let things happen to her. Um, and a way that there's, there's a, a lot of the book um, really looks at literary heroines. And, and that's why um, Gary and I chose a, an English professor um, who's teaching a course about um, star-crossed lovers. And among these star-crossed lovers are women like Medea, who is betrayed and fights back very viciously. And then you have other women um, like Queen Dido who um, is betrayed and commit suicide. So there's this whole um, spectrum of how women respond to being betrayed. And Taryn has a choice. Is she gonna be like Medea or is she gonna be like Dido? And is she going to be fierce or is she gonna be passive? So she has role models in literature and who does she choose to behave like? Well, you've answered my question about why he was an English professor, because, I mean, this could have taken place in the chemistry building or something, right, right. you know. Um, so, Gary, you teach at a, at a smaller college. You're both living in Maine, right? No, I teach at a very large college, a Northeastern University in Boston. Oh, uh, okay. Tesla's in, Tesla's in Maine. I live in, outside of Boston, yeah. Got it. All right. Yeah. So, you know, did you model the campus on, you know, your own university? And sure, sure. Yeah. I, I modeled at, on Northeastern, but called it the Commonwealth University. Uh, it happens to be located exactly where Northeastern is located across the Museum of Fine Arts, which, which, which is it's a locale in the book. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know that place well. And so I just changed the names of buildings and, and people and, um, and people have shuffled around in, in the space that would be familiar to anyone who knows that, that particular campus. Yeah. But even, even if it's a big campus, basically you're creating a kind of Agatha Christie country house environment when you, sure. um, I mean, the campus doesn't have physical boundaries to the extent that, that a castle or a manor house or something would, but nonetheless, it is a closed community, which makes it easier to contain your cast and, and what happens. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, so I, you know, I guess the bigger, Arizona State here is just ludicrously large. I mean, it's like 100,000 students with multiple campus. So right. you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to narrow it down. I guess that's why I was thinking that you knew a small college because it just seemed to me that, you know, that fit this design better, but. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's yeah. large and it's, it's probably 15,000 students as opposed to you know, 50,000 students. So, uh, you know, uh, 15,000 is large enough and, uh, you yeah. know, and yeah, it, there's a small, quality about the classrooms. That's why we made the course that Taryn takes with Jack a seminar called Star Cross Lovers, which yeah, also has built into its name the irony that Star Cross implies fate, that it was, you know, fate are the gods that moved me into your arms. You know, it's it's all choice. And that's what we wanted to do philosophically, say you are responsible for your actions. And that, that's what this book is that's that's part of the, the the gray portraits and the nuances you know they they did this to each other you know it's not faded you know so yeah. which is, is a theme within the book too yeah well I, I think the other theme that comes through um is how a, one mistake a moment of weakness can destroy your life 
and how far would you go to save everything you love? And this is this is where we ha we had to struggle a little bit with the fact that our main character really is Jack. Jack is the hero of this book, and yes, he and yet he does something really terrible. So how do you redeem that character? Uh, that was one of the challenges of the story, and the fact that we have two characters who are really not necessarily good people. Um, so we have to have reasons um, to root for Jack as his life spirals out of control. And that was, that was uh, Gary's uh, mission in this whole book was, how do you make this man likable? And how did you? Um, made him feel guilty, made him feel regretful, um, made him wish he had never done what he had done. He does not stand in front of the mirror and say, Taryn made me do this, or my wife who is, you know, kind of cool and her passion made me do this. I made me do this. So after they actually, you know, start their affair, which is very brief, he is quite contrite. And it, I, I, I imagine myself violating my own marriage vows to my wife and violating Title IX, you know, uh, um, com com compliance at you know, every university in America now, uh, where your job is at stake. And, and I imagine, oh my God, if I ever did this, how would I feel? And I just projected that into, into the psyche of Jack and I think made him somewhat sympathetic. Uh, at least understandable. Were, yeah. yeah, the stakes are unquestionably high for Jack. I mean, you know, he's yeah. rolling the dice against his marriage, his career, as you say, uh, which adds to his desperation. Let me go back to what you said about, um, you know, if you look at characters like um, Isolde or um, Medea, um, very often, Isolde particularly, um, there was a whole thing about, you know, the gods made them do it or it wasn't their fault. I mean, Isolde drank the potion, right? So um, right, right. falling in love with Tristan. I mean, I, I had a conversation with a woman who's written a variation on Camelot, um, but she's written it from the point of view of um, the Lady of the Lake. Um, and, you know, I asked her, if she could explain, or did she explain in her book, why Guinevere rolled the dice, you know, in the way that she did uh, and, and brought down, you know, not just a marriage, but a kingdom and, and the whole bit. What possible, what possible excuse can there be for Guinevere? And, you know, um, and, the, and the explanations almost always are, it wasn't really her fault. You know, there was like a supernatural force at work or, you know, whatever. And I'm going, no, <laughs> no, no, she actually didn't have to do that. Um, well, and and everybody wants to blame somebody else, but it's just basically human frailty and temptation. Yeah. Right. Um, as something right. that every human being deals with and every, you know, throughout their lives. So what happens when you yield to that? And um, that's what we were exploring. And you, we can't blame anybody else but these characters for doing what they did. Right, but they have to get to a critical point in their lives, you know, whether it's boredom um, or whether it's fear of a failing marriage or whether it's, you know, turning the classic, you know, middle-aged man, you know, this is, is this all there is? whatever or the desperate student or something you have to put them in a crucible really mm -hmm. before you know before they make bad choices at least you hope mm -hmm. that you do but right. we have to understand why they do and put their, ourselves in their in their shoes and understand i could have done that too I, it could sure. have been me in a moment of weakness and, so and that, um, yeah, yeah yeah i'm sorry at the, the most, Barbara, the most gratifying part of the reviews we have read online have been those that said these characters are very realistic. Mm -hmm. And that, again, ex exactly what Tess said, many, many reviewers said it, it, it puts, it, it creates a circumstance that you know is probably not going to end well, but you still yield to the id, drive, whatever it is, and you cross that line. Um, and um, that is the realism we were trying to create. Um, Jack has regrets. Karen has, there are two poles of, of, the, of the literary antecedents you talked about. There are two poles that she finds herself between, which is pretty much the polarity of the whole book um, in terms of, of female reaction. You have Medea, who is wronged by Jason, uh, they have two children and, and in the middle of their marriage, he takes off for the, the, the princess of Corinth 
And so what does Medea do? She kills her two children and she slays the princess. It's just getting back in a big time way. The other poem is what the, the test mentioned, uh, Queen Dido. She's, she's married to Aeneas in, the, in, in, in Virgil's Aeneid. And when he takes off to found Rome and, and you know, uh, uh, amplify his legacy, um, she gets on top of her funeral pyre and, and commits suicide with, with a sword. So it's either suicide or I'm going to go after this guy and seek revenge. And that is kind of what we have in the polarity of, of, uh, of Taryn. And she is realistic. She, she's not the, the, the crazy Glenn Close in, um, oh, help me with the title, <laughs> uh, Fatal Attraction. Right. But she is obsessed. She is needy. She is hungering for love. And that is recognizable, I think. And I think that the, the test did a great job in creating a very realistic, obsessed young woman. Des, do you think that vindictiveness is more a female trait than a male trait? No, I don't think so. I think I think I think it goes <laughs> to either to either gender. I mean, we all have to hear stories about ex ex boyfriends or ex girlfriends stalking their former lovers. You know, um, driving by their house, seeing who they're dating now. You know, maybe stalking them online through social media. That's not uncommon, and I think it yeah. does happens in both male and females. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there have been actually laws being passed about, you know, um, revenge porn and, you know, breakup porn and all the rest of it or yeah. messages. So yeah, I, th I think men, I'm, I'm always curious though, I'm not sure that men are so much vindictive as they are not believing that this could happen to them. I mean, it's, I, I often think that it's the male ego just refusing to accept it. Whereas I think, I think women can actually be more vindictive. I'm, I'm not probably not saying this very well, but. Maybe women are more vindictive in a different way. Yeah. You know, maybe women, um, maybe women retaliate in ways that are emotional and psychological or men maybe re retaliate in more physical ways. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that could be. And, you know, I think in both cases, you know, loss has a lot to do with it. You know, the, the mm -hmm. loss of a lover, loss of a family, loss of something can drive people to really desperate extremes. And it's um, degrees. It's degrees. I mean, okay, you go in and you you stalk them on Facebook. That's one thing. But then you break into their homes. That's another thing. And and you steal little souvenirs. That's another thing. And the next thing you know, it's a gun. So um, it's it's where is Taryn going to finally stop this this escalating stalking of her lover? Um, and where when is it, when does it go from yeah I can see myself doing that to oh my gosh she's nuts. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, right. So tell us about the structure of the novel. You've talked about, um, we've talked all around it, but how did you actually structure the narrative for this book? Well, it was interesting because we wrote it in a chronologic way. We, we started it off with the beginning of the affair and then two thirds of the way through the first draft, she's dead. And then the last third is the investigation. So um, we finished it that way. And then um, our editor made an interesting suggestion. She said, we, I love the female detective in this, that Frankie, um, who, Frankie Loomis, who only comes into the story two thirds of the way through because that's when she's coming in to investigate the murder. So the editor said, we wanna see her right from the beginning. Why don't we move Frankie early on in the book? And the only way to do that was to open up with the murder. So that changed everything. Suddenly we're doing a before and after structure. Uh, the first chapter is when the body of Taryn is discovered. Detective Loomis walks in um, and we know there's a murder, but we don't know how it happened. The metaphor um, I always like to use is we come across a train wreck. Now let's find out how the train got wrecked. And we go back in time and we go back and trace how this affair happened and up to the point of when she dies. So did you create Frankie together? I mean, is this a character that you both contributed to? Um, I, she's a woman, so I did her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I loved about Frankie is um, is she's she's middle aged. Um, I found her fun to write because she is an she's an experienced. She's a, a detective. She has twin daughters who are difficult. They're now eighteen. She's a mom, and when she walks onto the scene and she sees dead Taryn. She knows because she's a mom, mother's instinct that something is not right. This was not a suicide. Um, the little clues come to her very quickly because she's seeing things through different, uh, maybe the eyes of the man would not be able to, you know, 
um, to, to notice these details. So that was that was what I had fun with. Um, Frankie is is I, I like to think of her as Jane Rizzoli in 20 years. <laughs> ah, well, there you are. Of course, you had some experience doing that. Are you both happy with, you know, with that suggestion that the way you rewrote the book or restructured the book to make it come out that way? Of course, I thought it was really yeah, absolutely that's sure. I mean, it, it also makes sense that we begin with the dead body. I mean, it, it, the, the book is billed as a murder mystery. <laughs> if you wait to chapter 25, when she finally shows up dead, that seems a little, you know, a little odd. So uh, it was a great idea to move it up front. Well, there are there are books that are structured where you take much longer to get to know the victim. I was talking to Deborah Crombie at an event last week. You know, one of her most successful books, the the murder isn't committed till 156 pages in, um, and and it was it's deliberate because she really wanted you to mourn the victim, and so you you needed to spend a lot of time getting to know the victim, and you also needed to be surprised that this turns out to be the picture, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, you're actually thinking there's no murder in this book. What am I doing here? But, but it all, it all kind of comes out that way. And I thought it was a really interesting thing for her to do, but it is unusual. Yeah, it is interesting and it is unusual. And I think that's the kind of thing that an editor will go, mm -mm, that doesn't work for us. <laughs> so right. it's, yeah. uh, it, it's because I think that the market was looking at a murder mystery and they, they're thinking, wait, there is the, the murder takes place at, 100 page 160 then I, I lose out on the investigation somehow mm -hmm. but I think it's a, what Debbie Crummy did was sounds like a fantastic way to, to uh, it's just less it's just harder commercially I think well it is but I mean she's writing British mystery which you know almost inevitably has a slower I mean often has a slower pace anyway um, but um, I, I thought it was brilliant although as I say definitely Unusual. So Tish, you're, you know, you're accustomed to writing procedurals, although you've done many other kinds of books. So what would, I mean, to you, this is a, a police investigation as well as a psychological probe of these characters? It's both. Yeah. I'm from, from the point of view of Detective Loomis, it's a procedural. And from the point of view of Taryn, it's um, it's a nightmare. It's a, it's a disaster <laughs> that just spins out of control. That's the psychological part of it. Well, let's talk a little more about the professor because I thought he was a wonderful character. His actual name is Jack, oh, Jack. Jack Dorian. So yeah. Gary, you know, I mean, I assume you don't know anybody just like Jack or at least no, I hope no. not, but um, you must have run into a number of male professors that helped you envision this guy. Yeah, I mean, uh, in many ways, he's a bad boy me. Um, you know, that, <laughs> uh, and I have a much richer fantasy life than I have as a real one. So in a sense, I just imagined, you know, uh, uh, if I uh, took to a particular uh, a female in my class, what would I do, particularly if I'm a little frustrated at the home life? Uh, and I just exaggerated that. I just, you know, I just, just projected that. Um, we did have some, you know, back in when I first started teaching in the 70s, it was very interesting, professors dated their students, particularly the younger ones who were almost the same age. In fact, three of my colleagues, at least three of my colleagues, married their own students. Um, and back in the 70s, you know, which was the height of the sexual revolution, people looked the other way. Um, and it was only until more recently that it, 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 you know, it's certainly discrimination, um, that's favoritism, and that you're fraternizing with a student, you know, over whom you have grades. And, and it, someone actually got caught trading sex for grades or grades for sex. Mm -hmm. And he was immediately terminated. This is maybe 20 something years ago. But it's since then that the things have, um, have really um, come down very hard on any kind of fraternization with students, particularly over whom you have some kind of supervisory control, you know, grades or thesis advising. Um, I don't know anyone in particular, but I, in many ways, Jack is an amalgam of, of several people um, through whom I just force my own kind of, you know, um, prejudices or, or, or desires and um, how I imagined him um, in a situation. And thankfully, that ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't you think all this is really addressing a power imbalance? I mean, if you go back to Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton, really, you know, it was the 
I mean, I think myself, she was the greater actor in that drama, but that's just my opinion, um, possibly based on the dress. Um, but I mean, seriously, you know, but um, at the same time, the real argument was that there was an imbalance of power. Yeah. And, you know, it's going on right now with Governor Cuomo, who I gather just resigned today rather than face impeachment. And, um, you know, as you point out, if, if, if somebody has some sort of power over another person, it's an unequal relationship, which would be true of professors and students, right. for sure. That, what is interesting is that Karen also is very smart and very observant. She senses a frustration in him. She flatters him. She even says at one point, would you ever date a student? And then she flatters him by, he, he says, no, I would not. I'm married. It's the first of all, it's just, you know, I'm married. Secondly, it's against the rules. Um, and she says, that's what I like about you. You're really honest and you're really loyal. And then she turns around and seduces him. Or well, allows yeah. himself to be seduced, put it that way. Yeah. There's a, I think there's a big temptation oftentimes among young women, you know, coming into their own sexual prowess and so, so forth, forth to see if they can seduce people. I mean, I'll go back to Monica mm -hmm. and say, I think that was part yeah, of it. Yeah. You know, um, and... I mean, where, you know, literature and films and all are littered, you know, with seductresses or temptresses or, you know, women who want to test men in whether men can hold up, you know, can, can push back and survive that is a, is a pretty common uh, story thing. Yeah. You know, nothing, you know, when, nothing. When, you're a, when you're a young woman, that is your power, your sexuality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't have money, you don't have you don't don't have power in every other way, but that is the one thing that you have over over a man. Um, so yeah, it's a tool. They might they may choose to use it. Well, it's a tool, but I also think that because they haven't necessarily wielded it for a very long time, it may be a tool they don't really understand the power attached to it. You know, um, you you can think it's it's not going to go to as bad a place as it might go. It, and so, you know, that, that can be, I can hardly remember when I was young, so it's hard for me to go back and think about this, but I keep scratching my head because I don't know why, I guess I itch. Um, anyway, um, I think it's a wonderful book, and I, obviously you guys had a great time collaborating. Are you thinking of doing this again? Well, we I mean, both have the projects that we have yeah, to, we, yeah, yeah. We, you know, in our in our own uh, in our own sphere. So I don't think we have any plans to, to do any more right. collaboration. The other thing is, this took twice as long as any other book. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, uh, sure. Well, I can certainly see that. Yeah. Right. So, Gary, it, it you I know Tess is publishing history, but do you have a publishing history, not necessarily in crime fiction, that we should explore? Um, I write medical thrillers or biomedical thrillers, science thrillers, uh, some archaeological, some um, pharmacological, um, and um, they've all done pretty well. Um, and um, you know, I, I, this is this is a diversion um, Tuesday because it's a it's a cop procedural novel and it's a it's a um, character driven. Um, and um, so this was a, a, a fun diversion for me. I've written two other books that had cops in them, homicide cops. Um, and um, so, so, but the six books, I have, this is the ninth book, six of them are science stories, not science fiction, but like Elixir is, you know, developing an anti-aging drug. Another one is gray matter, boosting the intelligence of children from parents who want to raise geniuses. And flashback is um, an alleged cure for Alzheimer's disease that has a side effect that you know, sends people into a uh, into a um, reliving bad scenes over and over again. So they've all been research heavy. My background's in science, so I was able to find um, medical people in Boston who love talking shop. Uh, and uh, in Boston, the medical center, the universe um, doctors will will just help you out with your research. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Well, you seem for an academic extremely comfortable, you know, writing this kind of book. So, oh, I love to do it. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, it seemed obvious that you must have had some. You couldn't be a, a, a virgin at this and do it. No, so no. Uh, not with Tess asking me if she wants <laughs> to co-author a novel. <laughs> well, it's really been. A, it was a wonderful book to read, and I'm so glad that it's out there and doing well. Patrick, why don't we call you up and see if we have questions from the audience? They might mm -hmm. like to. 
I have to make sure he's actually, there he is. There he is. I'm here at my post. Um, let's see. Well, some of these questions you've actually already answered. Well. <laughs> um, Melissa, Melissa writes, uh, what inspired you to write together? And you've kind of gone into that. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Can you tell us a little bit more like uh, nuts and bolts about how the collaborative process worked in your case? Would, uh, would you divide up the spoils? Would some of you, you know, write a first draft and the other one follow along and polish it up? Or how did that work? How did you divide it up? Um, it was split up direct, really pretty much down male and female lines. If there was a male point of view, uh, Jack's point of view, that was Gary's job. And if it was a female point of view, that was my job because we wanted to see how differently we would approach this, this affair and how we would look at it differently. Um, I did the final edit just because I wanted to make sure that everything hung together well. Um, and you know, we would make suggestions to each other. I think there were things that I wrote that Jack would say, a student would never do that or a student would never say that. And there were things that, interestingly enough, that Jack would say, and I would go, I would, I would respond, oh, that is so creepy, you gotta take that out. And so <laughs> I'm, I, I think that what my, I was very, I'm very sensitive to my, to my audience and my audience is primarily female. And I know there are some things that men may think or men may say that are going to turn off these readers. And so, you know, I had to, we had to tone down Jack a little bit um, to make him more acceptable as a hero. I defer to Tess, <laughs> but I had some good jokes I'm going to recycle elsewhere. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I, I should go back and reemphasize the point they were making that part of the reason to do this was to look at, at a situation from the male and female perspective. Right. And uh, did you, did you learn from each other doing that? Yeah. I mean, did Gary surprise you Tess? And did, did Tess surprise you Gary? Well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I um there there was a scene where um Gary uh, not Gary Jack first sees Tara, and he responds to her or he looks at her in a, in a fairly sexualized way, and I said, do men really feel this way? Is that how men really see women when they first meet an attractive face? And because if that's the way it is, that's I I don't like that. That doesn't make me feel comfortable. So I asked my husband, and my husband says, "Yeah, that's a, that's the way we think." I'm sorry to say. So um, I was. Jacob. I, <laughs> yes, Jacob was on your side. Um, so I think I was introduced to the fact that yeah, we do look at the other gender in different ways. I think men look at women in a far more sexualized way. And well, I, I can't speak for other women, but I just feel that when I look at a man, I'm not necessarily, not necessarily thinking, oh, I'd like to sleep with him. I'm thinking, oh, he has nice eyes or he's funny or he has, a, you know, um, he's charming. Um, and I'm not sure that's the way men think about us. Well, you know, I can't help but feel, Tess, that power is a real, like a pheromone for women. You know, women can be, I'm serious, you know, can really be attracted to we see examples of it all the time you know to power sometimes money but i'm not sure that power isn't the more i mean sometimes it's just a mercenary thing okay you know a woman is interested in, in in more money than she's going to accumulate on her own but but i think that powerful men exude some sort of something that can draw women in where i think women often exude some kind of a sexual pheromone that draws men in because the women don't necessarily have any power. You know, I, I do think it's a different biological reaction. And I say this, I'm gonna tell you this in part because my Stanford University magazine that I read every month, every month has an ad in it from a woman who is marketing pheromones. That's I know. right, to attract <laughs> men, you know? And I'm going, seriously, does that really work? Because I've never tried it. But I mean, it is in every issue of the Stanford I see that. I see that. It's I also see. every issue of Smithsonian Magazine. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's, the, it's in there too. So, I mean, I'm not making it up that, you know, that there's a chemical thing that, that may well be going on and that, you know, that might be part of the reason that men and women respond differently. You know, my, my husband and I have this thing we call, what's her DQ? And that is desirability quotient. Oh, okay. Uh, and, you know, you measure either gender by their desirability quotient. And a man can make up for the fact that he's not attractive by being extremely funny, extremely intelligent, 
or extremely extremely rich, um, and that that can up his 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 DQ. For women, it doesn't matter if they're extremely funny. Uh, well, maybe rich matters, but what what matters most for a woman is that she's attractive, uh, and that just seems to be the way that that men are are geared. It probably is evolutionary. They're looking for somebody who can bear their children um, and spread their genes. So. Um, but, but that's, you know, that's true. If you look at biology, that's often true where the male is supposed to have like the peacock, the fabulous right. tail feathers and all, because that makes him more desirable to the yeah. female peacocks. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, it isn't always that the female has to look more attractive in nature. Very often it's actually the male that has to be, you know, like the elk with the horns and the whole, you know, the whole bit. Um, and I think it's Darwin in action. I mean, I think it's basically, you know, that the most attractive, the most powerful, whatever, are the ones that get to mate and keep it going. But let's take it to the vaccine argument. You know, I, I missed your opening discussion while I was, you know, somewhere else before we started here. But, you know, I've decided I am totally Darwinian about this. You know, that people people who take the vaccine are, are going to have a better chance of survival than people who won't. And, you know, I've, I've read some of the arguments. There was one in the Wall Street Journal today. I was just totally baffled by this guy. Um, but, but they truly believe it. And yet at the same time, you know, they're rolling the dice against survival, you know. And, and, is it possible? It, it, uh, yeah, maybe Darwin is, is uh, our Darwinian evolution is, um, it's working against people who are dupes. <laughs> who are easy to, uh, you know, to, to pull into um, crazy ideas. I mean, in this particular case, if they are, if they are following not science, but some Pied Piper, that they're more likely to... to well, the argument today, the guy in the journal, his argument was that he and his wife were monitoring this. You know, in other words, he was saying that he thought that he had the training and the judgment, he and his wife together, to, um, you know, not to follow the actual medical professionals, but to make their own independent qualified decision. And I wanted to say to him, dude, you know, what are your credentials here? You know, what is it that you think you know better than, than they know? Well, he got his degree from Facebook, of course. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> I, 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 um, and so, I, I, you know what, if he catches COVID and dies, no tears for me, <laughs> you know, because I, I just, I just can't buy into, I mean, I wear a mask again, not to protect the unvaccinated, but to protect me because this variant can break through. Well, we've I mean, all heard, reason. you know, my husband and I are both medical doctors and we have heard from relatives and friends that we don't know what we're talking about, that we should do our research. And we're told this by people who never went to college. Um, so it's very irritating to us, you know, as you can imagine that people who have no medical training whatsoever are telling us that we're ignorant. Well, where are they doing their research? See, that's the real question that I, I want it, I to bring up. What is it the, that the, they... Some, some people, because they believe it makes it so. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah, and, and that, that is, you know, I, I, we said this before, that, um, before you came on with Patrick, that... Um, there are people who say, well, the vaccine hasn't had enough time for the clinical trials. I mean, based on what? I mean, how long does one have to be in, in clinical trials? I mean, uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, we've been doing vaccines since 1917. So there's a lot of data that goes into the development of you know, all these other vaccines for different, um, uh, tweaking the molecules for different kinds of variants. I mean, and I think that's, there is a Darwin Award. You know what the Darwin Award is? Yeah. I absolutely <laughs> for these do. people who don't, don't get shots Award. and don't get masks, you know. <laughs> I know. Well, what we have are thousands of people embracing the Darwin yeah, Award yeah. instead of the few candidates. You know, I mean, I'm hopping around at the age of 80, you know, still going and on. And I attribute a great deal of that to the fact that I have been vaccinated against everything, including <laughs> Japanese encephalitis. And, you know, yeah. I can't remember what. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I was born, nobody got a choice. You were vaccinated for smallpox in the hospital as a newborn. If you were born in my generation, it wasn't, it wasn't optional. So somebody like me is going to be okay when the smallpox come out of the Siberian tundra, which there is some evidence it may well do. And, you know, I don't, I just, I just want to say to people, come on, 
you know, yeah. but anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that. <laughs> well, we, we can get really upset about this because I get upset every night when I'm talking to my husband about this whole well, issue. No, I just decided to be an unapologetic Darwin. You know, I mean, right. I really do think that survival of the species along the lines we were talking about, about pheromones and males attracting females, all the rest of it has a great deal to do. Um, I don't, I'm not going to live long enough to, to see the full effect of all this. I'm not going to make it for another 50 or 100 years to see what the fallout of this is. But I'm kind of no. sorry that I won't, because I think that there are so many profound changes that are going to um, result from, you know, from the experience we're all going through. And it may very well change um, the composition of the population. So we'll like see. All right, just, Patrick, that was much more than you ever wanted to unleash on all our unwary all viewers. Right. So. Well, actually, I want to hear what Tess was going to say. Tess had oh, a reply okay. there. I just wanted to resolve so I can get on a plane again and go to Europe. Please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> same here. Yeah. yeah, boy, I'm not going to get into that, any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> Wise decision, Patrick. I took it away from you. <laughs> uh, Kathy says, uh, I hate to ask the obvious to test, but is there going to be more Rizzolian Isles? And for Gary, what's next for you? Yes, there is a, there's a new Rizzolian Isles coming out. It's number 13. It is called Listen to Me, and it will be out next June. The fun part about this one is um, it's Jane and Maura, and we, we get a closer look at Jane's mother, Angela, who is... You know, she's a middle-aged housewife and revere, and it turns out she is a good detective as well, if only people would believe her. So that's uh, that's coming out next June. And the good news is that with any luck, Tess will be at the Poison Pen to discuss it and sign books. At least that's our hope. Hope so. Yep. Gary, how about you? Um, next book is called Served Cold, as in Revenge is Best Served Cold. Uh, it, it focuses on a, uh, a, a novelist who is, uh, whose third book is supposed to be his big breakout book uh, and, and set the pace for, set the, set the trail for uh, bestsellerdom. Um, he is savaged in a New York Times uh, book review by a, a young college professor who teaches detective fiction and is trying to impress his tenure committee because he's coming up pretty soon. And, and he, he, he accuses the book of uh, being one of those examples of dumbing down America. And this completely, this completely tanks the, uh, the, um, the novelist's future. Um, this next contract is, is withdrawn. All the, um, all the publicity he was gonna do, or, or you know, people just bow out of that. And he goes after the reviewer. So if any writers out there have gotten bad reviews, you might like the concept of this book going after the reviewer. <laughs> Stay anonymous when you when you post your review. That's the only way to go. <laughs> I know. Patrick and I do do acknowledge our reviews in our in our own publications at the Poison Pen. We stand actually we have other staff members that write reviews too. And you know, I think it's important that people know who wrote the review. Yeah, I write for Publishers Weekly and the vast majority of them are anonymous, right. which in my case is really, really helpful. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, it's like Amazon reviews. I asked somebody not long ago why they even bothered to read their Amazon reviews since, you know, if you don't know who wrote it, what possible difference does it make? But there seems to be some sort of dark pull on authors, you know, where they just can't resist going to Amazon <laughs> and seeing that they're getting trashed because their book was delivered late or the cover was torn or, yeah. you know, all the other reasons why all this happens. Actually, kind of I, do, I do have a, a question for Tess. Um, considering the milieu of the Rizzoli and Isles books, um, you know, apropos of all we've been talking about, can you tell us a little bit about the book and is it in this last several year period? Oh yeah, it takes place pr pretty much after the last, oh, uh, uh, I don't know if they're talking about COVID or what, uh, that, that milieu maybe? Is yeah. That, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yes, okay, it takes place after COVID's over because <laughs> because I don't want to deal with COVID in a right. novel. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of us writers are just, our next stories are, we sort of jump over this period and, and talk about it as if it's, a, it's something in the past. And, you know, my characters, they don't shake hands anymore. Um, they visit a hospital to do an interview and they, and they recall the fact that a lot of people died in this hospital mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So um, it's behind us. Gotcha. When the story. 
Same here. Yeah, kind of yeah, jump yeah. over the puddle. That's yeah. kind of a good approach, right? <laughs> Well, hopefully it'll be over with. And yeah. if, you write, if you write a book that's set in the middle of the pandemic, it's going to feel like it's dated already by the time. Right, it comes. right, right. <clears throat> right. Um, I think that's, let's see here. I think that's about it for the actual questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you plan to do more collaboration? You've already answered that. Probably not, but who knows? Um, <laughs> That's they might have a drink again together, you know? You just don't ever know the effect of alcohol. They all the booze. You want to go for a drink this weekend, Tess? <laughs> Could be. Well, this has really been fun. I'm sorry for my poor impulse control. I have to apologize to everybody who watched this, but you know, every once in a while, that's just the way, the way I roll. <laughs> When we're back on planes again, we can see each other in purpose. I'll see you at the bar, people. <laughs> Excellent idea. In any case, choose me. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have autographed copies of it. And it's really um, a wonderful, um, dark academic mystery. Um, and you've heard all the reasons why they wrote it, which are compelling. So I urge you to buy a copy and we can order more if we run out. So Gary, what a pleasure to host you. Um, it's our debut doing that. And Tess, it's always lovely to see you. So I'll look forward to June for sure, if not before. See you then. All right. Great. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so bye, much Bruce. for joining us. Bye. Thank you, Patrick. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks. <laughs>